everybody. Welcome, you're with Thank AJU, you. Biyacha Together. My name is Deb Engel Collin, and you are here on the AJU, Biyacha Together platform. We're going to get started in just a minute. I'm just going to wait for people to join us before I introduce our amazing, amazing panel this evening and our discussions on justice we shall pursue building the beloved community. So I'm just going to give it just another minute so people can populate. Again, my name is Deb Engel Collin, and it is my privilege and honor to welcome you here this evening for our Biyacha Together, Justice We Shall Pursue, Building the Beloved Community by AJU, spirited by AJU. My name is Deb Engel Collin again. I am the Relationship Manager for the Miller Introduction to Judaism program here at AJU. AJU is just a, a, an amazing jewel in the heart of Los Angeles. And the Biyachad Together platform was our response to the pandemic. And we are just thrilled to have these opportunities to meet together, to learn together, to challenge each other, to have thought provoking questions and conversations. And it is my honor this evening to introduce um, our panelists tonight. We have Reverend Mart Wicklock, who Jr., who serves as a community of Reed Temple AME Church in Maryland. And prior to his historic July 2019 appointment to the Reed um, Temple AME Church, Reverend Whit Whitlock served as the pastor of Christ our Redeemer AME Church in Irvine, beginning in August of 1998. Over the course of his ministerial and nonprofit career, Pastor Whitlock has raised more than $1.2 billion for the kingdom of God through individual donors, as well as corporate, federal, and institutional grants. Together with him, we have Reverend Dr. Najuma Smith Pollard, who is the founding pastor of Word of Encouragement Church and program director of the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement at USC. She is a frequent speaker and panelist for conferences related to women's empowerment, women in ministry, sexual violence awareness, and personal development, the black church, and civic engagement. Wow, I don't know how you have time for anything else. Um, she is also, in addition to her core work, an author, a radio show host, a business owner, and professional mentor. She is a lover of social media, music, dancing, movies, fitness, traveling, and her babies, Dorian, Zuri, Daniel, her angel child, and grandbabies, Dylan and Naomi. And moderating our conversation is our own Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson, who holds the Abner and Rosalind Goldstein's Dean Chair of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies and is a Vice President here at American Jewish University. He is a member of the Philosophy Department and is particularly interested in theology, ethics, and the integration of science and religion. He is also the Dean of the Zacharias Frankel College in Potsdam, Germany, ordaining conservative rabbis for Europe. Without further ado, Rabbi Artson, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you to these wonderful speakers for joining us. I'm so grateful for you devoting the time, what I'm sure is a very busy time. Um, and also thank you to everyone who's joining us to listen and to participate. It really is uh, not insignificant that you would make the time to be with us for what I think is the most important conversation we can be having these days. And so thank you everyone for being with us. Special shout out to my parents. Um, <laughs> I want to start by jumping right in. And so what I'd like to do uh, with the two of you reverends is to ask you just opening thoughts, things you want to put out on the table, how you'd like us to start. And I'll start, uh, Najuma, with you, if you'd, if you'd be willing. Uh, hold on one second. You're muted. Can we unmute the reverends, please? Okay. Nope. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All there right. We Start again. Here we go. <laughs> it's okay. Good evening, um, Rabbi Bradley and Deborah. Thank you. And to my big brother, uh, Mark, it's always a pleasure um, to to see him and to to do great stuff with him. He's known me since I was um, 17, eight, 18. 
Um, and we both come out of uh, First Amy Church under the tutelage of Dr. Cecil Chip Murray. Um, and uh, I'm, so I'm excited to be on tonight uh, with you all for this conversation. And um, the way I'm feeling where I want to start is, um, number one, I'm grateful for all these wonderful conversations. Um, I believe that they are certainly cathartic, but also an opportunity for learning and sharing um, and having a better understanding of each other. Um, and, that, and that together, um, the changes that we need to, that need to happen in this country, I believe they can happen as long as, as we continue to work together and even um, allow ourselves to be uncomfortable and say some things that need to be said and share some things that, that we don't often share and sometimes we may even overlook. Um, and so I'm, I'm feeling hopeful. I'm feeling hopeful. You know, it's, it, and thank you, uh, Dr. Pollard, uh, both the rabbi and Deborah, thank you for this opportunity to share. Um, I, I, I am mystically optimistic. Um, I'm in Prince George's County, uh, Maryland. Um, a, a county that's predominantly African-American, the richest county in the world, a county that has the leadership of African-Americans as our supervisor. Uh, we have uh, strong African-American leadership. Uh, we did have a police officer, a police chief today who happened to be white, but he resigned because of the challenges that he experienced on his police force. Yet he was pushing for more reform than any other police chief that I've known yet uh, he was caught up in the sweep that is taking place throughout the country looking for police reform. Yet talking to him, I felt that there was a ray of hope uh, because the language that he expressed matched my theology and philosophy, yet he had to resign today. Uh, and I'm wondering who's gonna come in behind him. So as I am a, a news junkie, I am, push to believe that we sometimes get caught up in emotions and not facts. And there are some victims of this movement that um, we will never know what could have happened if they'd been given an opportunity to share. Um, but now they have become um, the brunt of somebody's attack. So for me, I'm pessimistic, I'm, I'm 66. I've had an opportunity to see things happen, some changes. I was involved with the 1992 unrest with Rodney King, changed my whole life, uh, gave my life to that. But uh, when I drive back into the community that I gave my life to, and I still see the same poverty, the same despair, the same uh, drug challenges, the same uh, teenage pregnancy, the same dropout rate, I'm wondering what, what, what is really taking place. So I'm pessimistic but I am a religious person, I'm still hopeful. Wonderful. I'm, I guess what I'd like to do to, for, for my piece of opening thoughts is share a piece of Torah. Um, I had the privilege two Shabbases ago to listen to Reverend Najuma lay some serious Bible down and, and uh, really transform my family. I've told her that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking from this week's Torah portion, it speaks about Moses and the children of Israel sending in people into the land ahead of time to check it out, mm. right? And they're petrified. And they go to scout the land, and they come back with a terrible report. They say that we looked to ourselves like grasshoppers, and that's what we must have looked like to them, mm. you know? And I think there's, there's so many forces trying to make our people small and make us feel unworthy and little and undeserving, and, and we take it in. And then we project it back out. We assume that's how other people see us. So what I want to invite all of us to, all of us listening as we continue, and this hopefully will be only one of many conversations that we will each of us personally engage in in the months and years ahead, because this is not going away, um, is don't be small in your own eyes. You are worthy. You deserve. You get to be at the table. You get to have a place. You don't earn that. You, you take your place. So yeah, that's yeah. the first thing. And then don't assume how other people are going to see you, right? And that applies to everyone coming to the table from wherever particular place we come from. 
you're still talking to a human being. So the minute we start to assume, oh, I know what group they're part of, they're gonna think this about me, then you've made them invisible and you made yourself invisible. So, so come to the table in the fullness of light and, and come to it as you are. And then if I, if I may just say one other thing, I think that for a lot of white people, we get tripped up by how fragile and defensive we are. And, and one of the ways that we do that is the minute someone says racist or racism, we go all, all freaky. And, and, and I'd like to say something specifically to the people for whom that resonates, right? There certainly are old fashioned kinds of racists, the people who will murder people out in public or say horrific things or fire someone or beat someone, or that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if we can move those of us who need to be doing a lot of listening right now I wonder if one of the ways we can listen is in terms of outcome, that there's a system that has chronically, chronically kept a certain group of people down and battered and oppressed. And if we can do something about that, if we can break that system, that's the system of racism. So instead of immediately rushing to defend ourselves individually, no, no, I don't think you can grow up in this country without having sucked that in. I know that I have. But if instead of responding with defense, we respond with there's a system that's breaking people, brutalizing people, killing people, and, and I could start to do something about it. Maybe that's a better way to go. So in that way, I want to turn to the two of you as thought leaders and people of great spirit and ask your thoughts on what's changed, why now, what's the same? Um, what's changed, why now, and what's the same? Um, I'm going to start with what's the same, this conversation. <laughs> and Pastor Mark and I were at Fame together 28 years ago. I was much younger, of course. And, <laughs> and um, uh, he was younger too, of course. But, um, <laughs> um, and it's, it's disheartening to still, like 28 years is a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and we're still having to, not necessarily with you, Rabbi, and, and not necessarily with the, those that are part of uh, AJ, um, AJU, but we're still having to explain and, and help people understand, no, actually this country is racist at its core. Like we still have to, like we're, this is the same conversation. Um, so that's disheartening. That's, that's what's still the same for me is that, is that there's not a universal kind of, un, you know, it'd be different if people just said, honestly, you know what, you're right. The country's racist and we're not ready to change. At least that's honest. Yeah. But to look at the details of even just this season, pandemic, which unveiled uh, the, and after the disparity in, in the health system and mass incarceration that's wiping out black and brown communities, and now the issue of police brutality, which is the sixth killer for black men in this country. So for someone to look at, at anyone black and say, no, it's no, 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 you're, you're wrong. That doesn't exist in our country um, is, is disheartening and that we're still having, and we're in this same place. Um, what, what has changed? I think the voices to some degree, you have new voices, you have new ways of doing things. Um, 28 years ago, we didn't have social media or at least not to the extent that we do now, um, which allows for, another layer of advocacy and activism and engagement and involvement, um, which is part of what, which is part of why I believe we have this huge kind of like tsunami of people wanting to, um, to be part of the justice, you know, racial justice uh, movement um, because social media has, has allowed our worlds to collide in a way that they've not done so in the past. And uh, the therapy is what's, what's the same, what's changed, and what needs to happen? Was that the... What changed? Why now? What's the why, same? Why now? Why now? Because it's still urgent. It's, it's actually never stopped being urgent. Yeah. Um, but it's, a, it's another level of urgency 
and again, I think it's that convergence of, of our of, of societies due greatly to social media and internet connectivity and this global society. Um, it has uh, turned the fire up a little bit and, uh, and, and the moment is urgent. And it's, it's always been urgent, but it got turned up a little bit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Reverend Mark? Your first question was, what has changed or what hasn't? What's changed? What's the same? And why now? But you can do, do what you want with it. <laughs> what hasn't changed? Um, and then what's changed and why now? What hasn't changed is this, <laughs> is the absence of love. Uh, for me, what 92 and what uh, the civil rights movement of the 60s and certainly the death uh, of Martin Luther King and the life of Nelson Mandela, uh, Dr. Abraham Heschel, it's, it's, it's this, this, this clarion cry that we all experience from these wonderful men and women of, who were just awesome leaders that, and the, and the, and the unifying cry was that we have to love one another. Yeah. How could we watch a video of a man by the name of Rodney King being beat, 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 and then a jury of not his peers <laughs> find these police officers uh, not guilty, and then the city erupts in flames? <laughs> you know, what, it, 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 the message that Cecil Murray, the message that King, the, 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 the message of my wonderful leaders within the Jewish community was love. But it seems like we haven't picked that up. It, it just seems like we've missed the mark on that. So what hasn't changed? It's, all the other stuff is a reaction to the absence of love, right? Yeah. So uh, what has changed? What I love, what has changed is um, the people like Najuma, who are much younger than me, she didn't like to admit it, but she is, and the people who are much younger than Najuma are saying, you won't grab my back. We won't negotiate this any longer. Yeah. We, won't, we won't allow you mm -hmm. to put me in handcuffs when I have been talking to you for 40 minutes a civilized conversation and now you want to arrest me and now you expect me to be docile and allow you to treat me any way I want to. No, I'm going to fight you. Where, where in the past we see Dr. King taking a knee, we see Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and that's treated without love. So now there's this wholesale, I'm not going to take it no more. I love that. I, 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 yeah, what's changed? The media's changed. Yeah. But we saw the pictures of the hoses happening in Birmingham, Alabama. We saw the pictures of the Selma, Alabama uh, beating uh, of, 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 of our wonderful congressman now. But, but so we've, we've had some form of media, but even that hasn't shocked our system. So uh, what has changed is that now we're fighting back. We're fighting back. And I, I accept and, and like it. But what also hasn't changed, what also uh, what also has changed is the black church. Eddie Glaude out of uh, Princeton says the black church has become this mecca for prosperity versus liberation. It is, we've lost our way. We have become this place where pastors now work, wear designer suits and drive expensive cars and brag about the square footage of their homes and how much taxes they pay or don't pay. Uh, that's changed. And for the first time in human history in the United States for civil rights, the black church is not in leadership, in a leadership position. Neither do you see uh, uh, pastors on being interviewed. That's when I got a call from this wonderful university and I'm going like, you want to interview me? Why? I mean, what are we doing? We're giving speeches. The day for speeches is over. And the black church is real good at giving a speech, but I don't know if we've done anything beyond give a speech, Deborah. So for me, it, it, it really is, what has changed is the silence within the black community, the si not, not the black community, but the black church. Mm -hmm. What's changed is, uh, are the pictures of Kent State have now been reversed. These kids who were 
executed at Kent State for standing up for justice. There, once again, these white kids are standing up for justice. This time it's not by Vietnam. It's, it's for men like uh, George. It's for men like Roderick. It's for men like Avery. It's for women like Breonna Taylor. And it's no longer this high level civil rights issue. It's about the fact that people are being killed. And I love seeing what's taking place all over this country. I was in New York, not New York, I was in DC, protesting with them on Black Lives Matter protest, uh, 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 Plaza. And the majority of the people there were uh, young white kids. And, and that was wonderful to watch. What do we need to do now? Why now? Why not now? It's a Kairos moment. Mm -hmm. I'm pulled right by, by the text that says, that my Jewish brother says to Moses as they're resting near uh, Migdal, if I'm pronouncing that right. And, and they said, why did you pull us out of Egypt? Why did you pull us out of slavery? Why, we were comfortable taking care of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And what that said for me was God put them in a position, Yahweh put them into a position to come out of their comfort zone. Yeah. come out of this this place that we've this pandemic of luxury yeah. where we are very comfortable with three meals in a house that we can afford when other people are lying in gutters and languishing in the liabilities of being in love so that 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 for me why now because god is calling for it right now to bring about a change Amen. Amen. I, I can only add, a, uh, if I could, a few thoughts. Um, one is, I think for a lot of us, the shock is that this was hiding in plain view. And I know that feels utterly reprehensible to any African American who hears it. But, you know, my education was supposedly a good education, and there were no people of color in any of what I learned. You know, so I look back on horror. I went to Harvard University. I studied, I majored in American history and literature. I never read an African-American author until I graduated and realized that's ridiculous. Mm. Right? And then I read these authors that were glistening in their insight and their talent and their wisdom. And, and like, so part of it, I think, is there's been an eye-opening that's been building up over several years, over most of our lives, that just can't be held back anymore. That the story's bigger than the people who thought they could control the story, right? That, that, um, that the American story includes things that were systemically removed from my education, right? I feel like I was robbed. Um, and I know that sounds ridiculous, because how could you not have seen it? It was, it was every day, it was everywhere, but there was a, a whole system designed to make a whole lot of people not know what they saw. Mm. And I think that's breaking. And that's breaking in part because of the amazing young people you have both talked about, who are just saying, not anymore, this is ending, we're done with this. I think there's some not so young people who are taken to the streets and saying, not anymore. And, I, and so I guess I want to also think about the way that this liberation process is cumulative. Mm. I think that the Black Liberation Movement taught American women they didn't have to take it anymore. Mm. And they stood up and they said, okay, we're going to launch feminism now. And we're going to do it because we see Black men and women standing free and it looks pretty good. And then that also helped teach the gay lesbian liberation movement. It's not a coincidence that we have Stonewall at the same time, that, that people are looking at each other's cues and saying, I don't have to take this. I don't have to live in your narrative anymore. I can tell my own story and I can stand in my own place. And then I think that comes harvesting back, that then you get a new generation of people for whom there's a new level of expectation of what freedom and dignity entails. And so I, I celebrate that and I celebrate the way we've all pushed and encouraged and nurtured each other. Each moment of liberation liberates others. And that, to use your language, Reverend Woodblock, that's God's working through us. Yes. God, God, every time we see another person stand in freedom, we say, oh, I could do that too. 
I don't have to be, I don't have to put up with it either. And I just think that's part of the hopefulness of this time is that for the first time that I can remember, large numbers of white people are taking to the street and calling their legislators and insisting that things change and people are getting fired, right? They, did, they, they used to get away with it and now they're getting fired, you know, and people are losing their job because someone holds up a camera and catches them at it and the next day they've lost their job. And so I don't in any way think that we've turned a corner yet, we're not there. But what we are is getting ready to make a big change. And, and so that fills me with hope. I, I, I want to just jump in and say some real quick rabbi to that. Please, don't um, be quick, say it. <laughs> um, while cameras are important, I don't think it's the cameras. I think it's, pre, it's accountability. Because yeah. we've had cameras before. As, as Mark alluded to, we've, we've had cameras. It's people deciding to hold someone else accountable. Yeah. That's, that's where the liberation begins, yes. is individuals willing to hold their counterparts accountable, not because it's called a camera, because cameras actually have not, never helped a black person yeah. alone, you know, just alone. Right. It was people right. wanting, having the courage mm -hmm. to lose whatever they got to lose mm -hmm. to hold somebody else accountable. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to just throw out there that that's not the cameras have never served black people. It's okay. the it's people standing up willing to hold their corporations, their board members, their politicians, their friends, their neighbors accountable. Yeah, if I can piggyback, I mean, <laughs> King said the um, a riot is the voice of the unheard. Mm -hmm. He also said, um, I will never remember. The, the the rhetoric of my uh, of my enemies. I will never remember. Please forgive me. The the foolishness of Donald Trump, yeah. but I will forever remember the silence of my friends. And I I would say the same thing. Yes. I will remember the silence of the church. Right. Uh, and, and and the challenge is well, the exciting part is when you hear Black Lives Matter being shouted in Australia, in Austria, and in Germany, and yeah. in and, and in South Africa, in Cape Town, when you hear it ringing from every mohill and every mountain in America, it, it to me, it, that, that to me reminds me of the text that says in the book of Exodus, I think for me, chapter 14 saying, stand still, yes. yeah. stand still mm -hmm. and God will fight your battle and you will never see them again. Yeah. <laughs> There are people, as Reverend, as Dr. Smith said, that will never occupy the office again when we decide to stand, not sit down, but stand still for your rights. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. So, what's your, you have a message to share? Uh, a message to share? Um, <laughs> I got a lot to say. Uh, <laughs> um, I think my, the message that I know that I'm, the message I'm supposed to talk about um, is, um, is to really just help encourage, as a pastor, encourage my members to stay focused um, and to really keep our eyes on the process and the work. Um, and, and to be not, and not to just be a pastor that, to Mark's point, is just giving great talks but being part of the activism work. And so, you know, if it's a meeting they call me for, I'm gonna be there. Um, tomorrow I plan to be at the Breonna Taylor protest um, because, and we'll talk about that more later because black women's narratives keep getting lost in these kinds of times, but we'll talk more about that later. So, um, you know, for me, the message is to be, you know, to be a prophetic voice, but also to be present in using my prophetic voice creating and encouraging the, others to be present. For me, it's creating the beloved community. It's, it's, it's that which God, is that what Martin Luther King talks about. Mm -hmm. It is creating an egalitarian community where there is no unemployment or poverty or uh, these, these social economic levels where I am muted because of my race or my gender or my choice sec or my sexual preference, but I am free to speak, speak truth to power. Uh, and, and then within this beloved community, 
it really is about seeing the God in that person. We, we within the AME Church, we use this term: "Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world." Um, and, and even, uh, and that means that I must see uh, the goodness within you. I must see it within you. Um, uh, and 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 I continue to mourn, Amen, the loss of of, of these young men and women uh, who have gone before us. Um, and I mourn because of the great faith it took for them to stand up and for them to uh, uh, not allow societal norms to shape their narrative. Mm -hmm. that, that means that they, they, they had the audacity to love themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What I loved about Rashid was he loved himself enough to not be handcuffed. Now, Whatever the reason, yeah, he may have had a warrant. I, I don't know. He may have had a record. But he said, no, you're not going to do this to me. I've done nothing wrong, right? I, I may have fallen asleep, but I didn't hurt anybody. I pulled. I did everything you did. He loved himself. So I have to love somebody, but it begins first by loving me. And if I love me, then I have the ability to love somebody. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I would only add to the powerful words you've offered here. Um, that love that you keep talking about. I've always loved the fact that in the Hebrew Bible, there are a lot of different words for love. Right. And the most frequent word for love is chesed. So in the book of Psalms 89, it says, Olam chesed that God will build the world through love. Mm -hmm. But the thing about chesed is it's not a feeling. It's a feeling that leads to doing, right? It's the activism that Reverend Nizuma is talking about, right? That, that if you love somebody, You'll think they're worth taking a risk or speaking out or doing something about it. If you don't do anything, right. you, you're just talking. It's not love, right? A parent who says, I love you, I love you, I love you, and then neglects their child, that's an abusive parent, right? So to use the rhetoric of love, and we all come from traditions that have hidden behind that from time to time, right? But not to turn it into, show me, show me do something about it. Like, I think that's the call that God's inviting us to is the love of chesed. Do something about it. And, and then the only thing I want to add, Najuma, to your list of who should be holding who accountable, I want to say that we got to start on that list, many of us, me, with holding myself accountable. Absolutely. Mm. What have I not been doing? What have I not been saying? How have I been allowing this to continue in my lifetime? What are the moments where someone could have used my speaking out or reaching out or being present? I got to start before I point the finger at lots of other people who also deserve to be held accountable and we need to do that. I think as a person of faith, exactly, I got to start with myself and say, how do I clean house inside too? Not instead of those other things. It's still about chesed. It's about showing the love. But it starts with holding myself accountable, which also means then listening to messages that are uncomfortable or pointed at me or highlight what I've not been doing right. or could stop doing. And, and to Mark's point about the church, you know, clergy, we have to hold ourselves accountable to do more than just, you know, preach rhetoric or just talk. We have, you know, we're also being, you know, examined at another level. And that's why I was saying, you know, my message is, is that Najuma is not just a sound, is not just, you know, tinkling, was it sounding brass and tinkling, whatever, yeah. uh, that, <laughs> that I'm doing more than just talking, but I'm, I'm engaged. I'm part of the, whatever the process is going to be. Yes, um, yes. And that's my, that's me holding me accountable to not only my, my call as a pastor and a prophetic voice, but my call as a black woman and, uh, and, and a call to humanity. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's going to segue into what I want to talk about next, which you already alluded to. Uh, you mentioned that tomorrow there'll be a rally for Breonna Taylor. Yeah. And there have been a whole lot of Black women who have been victims of the hate that's out there. Yeah. So um, that feels really important. C can we talk for a moment about how do we honor and mourn the victims, and specifically women like Breonna Taylor, who, as you said, their, their narrative tends to sink down and the male narratives take over. So, right. Najuma, would you start us on that? Um, sure, thank you. Um, 
yeah, that, you know, that's, it just tends to keep happening. Um, and so one of the things that as a, as a woman, as a black woman, I have to be, and this is not to say that one is more important than the other, but as a woman, as a black woman, I have to also stand with those black women who have also been unjustly um, killed and to have, who've never received so much as their killer being arrested and charged. Um, and so that's why, you know, we'll be with the, the, the march tomorrow with Breonna Taylor, but also lending my voice to that space because um, it does tend to happen. And there's a lot of reasons why that happens. So it's on the part of, of so many of us um, to, to continue to say, no, Breonna Taylor, the Breonna Taylors of our world will not go ignored. And um, we cannot claim that we are seeing change in movement if, black, if the black woman is not secure and her voice is not heard um, and not elevated to, to a standard um, where, where things can change. And so, you know, that, that's where I'm at with, with the Breonna Taylor case and others is making sure that um, we are calling for justice in that case, because justice right now would be for the officers to be arrested. That would be the first step. That yeah. would be the first step. And that has to happen just like it had to happen for um, George Floyd and all the others. And there's so many cases, there's so many cases. Um, so we have to continue to, to stand with those families, stand with those communities and, um, you know, and, and advocate in that way. And I'm, I have a friend who's in Minneapolis. And so she and I have been in dialogue about some things that she's doing and how we can work together. Um, so, you know, there'll be more to come. Good. We're counting on it. You can Reverend bet. Whitlock. Well, you know, I, 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 the Brianna Taylor case is significant for me. Um, here, this woman is literally shot eight times while asleep in the bed. That was tough for me. What was even tougher for me was Sandra Bland case mm -hmm. uh, in 2015, where it, it, it definitely showed that this police officer escalated um, the situation and then he militarized the, the pullover, mm -hmm. where this woman who is a professor, who I mean, uh, she works for a university, she's new, she's 28 years old, and, and, and people say that they had the nerve to believe that she hung herself in, in jail. Really? Who does that? Now, if that had been a little bitty white girl who ha that happened and we saw the film, all hell would have broke out because there's no way that a 28-year-old child girl hangs herself in jail by simply getting pulled over on the stop sign. But nothing's done. Nothing's done. So, I, and, I, and I really have problems with people who say, why are you saying black lives matter and not all lives matter or Jewish lives matter or Christian lives matter or mine? What, 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 what takes away from your life when I say my life matters? And so, and, 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 and the real challenge that I think we face is particularly for the Christian community, we still don't recognize the God in, 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 in most women. We overlook it. Uh, I was pleased when uh, you told me that Reverend Njuma Smith, uh, Dr. Reverend Njuma Smith Pollard, not only wanted me on the air, amen, but I would be on with her. Because mm -hmm. I'm now at a place where if there's a panel of all men, I back out. I mean, this is like okay. way too much. Uh, we need to start recognizing the, the lack of love that we show to women. And, 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 and I think it begins with a bunch of insecure men who don't even think about it. Then they say, oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, yes, you are. You, you don't prioritize it. And it's time for us to begin to prioritize it. You know, I think that frailty that I talked about is not just true of white people. It, it's true of anyone who's in a position of power vis-a-vis right. -vis someone, and, and, and many of us are in positions of power to multiple people, even if we feel like we're objects of some other relations, you know? So it's as if we learn nothing from what it was like to have someone's 
foot on your head, you know, you then put your foot on that person's head. And so I think we do that. So you've invited something that I want to say right now. I want to speak to my brothers, Jewish and sisters, Jewish brothers and sisters. And I want to say, if you were talking to a European and you were talking about the Holocaust and you said, tried to talk about anti-Semitism in the Holocaust and all they said is, why do you keep focusing on Jews? Why don't you talk about how it's bad? To, you know, a lot of other people got killed too. Right. I know what I do when, when Europeans say that. To, I shut down. Like I'm, I'm gone. I'm not, I'm not in the conversation. I, I think that killing those other people was also bad. I'm on the record. I think killing anyone is bad. But I'm talking about this horrendous crime against my people. Absolutely. And I don't want you to change the subject. Absolutely. So here's what I want to say without qualifications. I want to say Black Lives Matter. Period. Black Lives Matter means they are uniquely under threat. And I need to put my voice and my body in front of them so that they can be heard and seen and safe. Black Lives Matter. We got to get a whole lot of people saying that mm -hmm. in every community because that is the fault line. It's not a bug of the system. It's a feature of the system. And until we can just say that, mm -hmm. and we can say that without guilt, but with responsibility, it will never change. So I just want to say that here and tonight, Black Lives Matter, period. Thank you. And yeah. that, is, that is what, the, the, to Mark's point, that's the love. That's, that's love. the love. Oh, that's that the love. love. Right. So the God, the God who created the world in love also brings down pharaohs. Right. There's that arc of justice. Right. And, and so we got to be on the side of the Hebrew slaves and not on the side of the pharaohs. And our silence does that. Mark, you were going to say something, please. Well, it really bends towards justice. It, 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 I lived in both L.A. and uh, in Orange County um, while I lived in California. I now live in Maryland. Um, and, and, and I live in this place called Prince George County, which is like the largest black county in the United States. And I do feel like Wakanda forever. <laughs> Wakanda forever. But my point is, when I moved to Orange County, I really felt African-American. Yeah. It was like when a police officer would pull up behind you, literally, they would stay behind you a long time. Whites don't understand that. Nope. Whites have no clue what it's like to go into a department store and here, and I, and I worked for USC and I, I pastored my church, got two master's degrees and a doctorate. And I'm, I'm followed around like I'm a homeless guy looking to pilfer from your store and I probably make more than the, than the store manager or the, you know, you know I mean, right. really, really, really. And Yet you're subjected to this, 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 this intense scrutiny and you help build this country. And so until that begins to change, until we recognize that, as Fannie Lou Hamer says, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and again, that gets back to, I think that white people both willfully deafened themselves to the cries, right. blinded themselves to the site. And then also they've just, we, and I'm including myself in that, we don't make a point of meeting and listening to people of color just talk, mm -hmm. right? Talking to, I was talking to a friend who was arrested going to get ice cream in his neighborhood. And I thought, so of course, and, and beaten too, punched in the face. Oh my God. Now, now that's, and so of course he sees police down, driving down the block and filters it through a lifetime of that. I stand next to him on the same block watching the police drive by and I'm filtering it through, oh, look, there's the police, hi guys, right? And unaware that there's a story next to me that I need to know. Right, that I need to know. So this is really, we have to do militant listening. I wanna say one thing and then I wanna to turn to you guys again. Um, there's an author, Mark Gonzalez, one of my students. Um, I told my students that I was uh, listen, gonna be talking to you tonight. Um, and he sent me words of encouragement. 
Um, first of all, you're not the first white person to say something stupid. He said, I'm sure they'll help you. So, um, but, but he also gave me this teaching of Mark Gonzalez who talked about we all need to be children of fierce vulnerability. Yes, yes. Children of fierce vulnerability, yes. right? And that's part of the love we can give each other is to be vulnerable. Yeah, I may screw up, but that's not going to stop me from trying, not going to stop me from doing the work. And, and I trust that there'll be people who will tell me, oh, you screwed up there. You know, that was bad. But you keep going. You yeah. keep going. You listen. So we are all of us clergy, and I know we're getting closer to the end. Um, I would love it. You know, we're, I will tell those of you who are listening, we had the privilege of having uh, Reverend Azuma come and speak at our school. Uh, about a year ago, and the students still talk about that experience, um, such wisdom and strength, and really, you 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 lifted all of us. Um, and then, and then, I'm a member of Ikar, and and uh, you speak there almost as much as our rabbis speak, <laughs> uh, and that makes us happy. So I, I wouldn't want to have two great reverends here if we couldn't also pray together, because that's got to be our home base. Mm. So I was hoping we could take a moment and do something. I know the Jews in the audience are starting to squirm because we don't do out loud public prayer so good, um, but I'm hoping that's something that we can grow to learn from our African-American churches and friends. Uh, and maybe, Reverend Mark, if you wouldn't mind just lifting us in prayer first, and then Reverend Najuma, if you'd be willing to, and then I'll try to limp along at the end. Okay, absolutely, absolutely. All right, let us pray. God of our weary years, mm -hmm. God of our silent tears, God has brought us thus far by faith. We're leaning on you for an everlasting love. Help us to take the mask that grins and smiles from our faces. Help us to achieve the transparency that you so desire for us. Help us to come out of ourselves into the greater self of you because we are the Imagio Deo, created in your image, with the ability to do far more than we ever thought we could. Help us to love one another, and it begins by loving ourselves. Forgive us for our frailties, our faults, our foibles, our fractured image of ourselves. Because as we see ourselves broken, we also see you broken. Stand us up and let us love one another. Let us love one another even when it's difficult, even when it seems unrealistic. Help us to love beyond ourselves. And when we do, that's when we can say we are who you would have us to be. We pray this prayer. Amen. 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 Um, God, um, Mother, Father, God, God, our Creator, um, we come this evening um, humbled and some hurting some hungry, some are curious, some chaos, some are confused, and some have questions. And we bring all of this, and some are angry, and some are hopeful, and some are not hopeful. And God, tonight we come bringing all of that to you as we try to navigate going forward to building this beloved community. God, help us to receive your love that you pour out for the whole wide world. 
Help us to receive that for ourselves so we can live that out with other people, no matter where a person is from or the color of their skin or their orientation or their lifestyle, whatever the case may be, God, faith, tradition, help us to receive your love so we can then embody your love and pour out your love so we can really live into being this beloved community where justice and equity for all is the standard and not the exception to the rule. It's the standard for everyone. Mm. So help us to do that, God, in this season. Help us to do that. Help us to love, receive your love for the world so we can become and live into being the beloved community. The prophetic vision that you gave, Dr. King, help that vision become our reality. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Holy One, I quiver when I think about how long you've taught us to love each other, to have one law that governs us all, one standard of right and wrong by which we are each measured. How long you have taught us that we are to be brothers and sisters to each other, to nurture each other, to defend each other, to protect each other. And how long we have, whenever we rise to any power, used our fragile hold on power to try to make ourselves great by keeping others down. Mm. And I think how much sorrow we have brought to you I know the pain of a parent who sees children quarreling, bullying, abusing. I know what that must do to your heart. So I pray that you give us those new hearts. I pray that you remind us, Lo tu halahit alem, as it says in your Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, you shall not be indifferent. Mm. shall not be indifferent when you hear the cries of your brothers and sisters, whether they look like you or not. You shall not be indifferent when you have the comfort of your own life and you see others having their comfort stripped from them and taken away. You shall not be indifferent when people say, I need to talk to you. And you will open your ears and open your hearts and you will listen. Isaiah speaks about those people who have ears but do not hear, and eyes but do not see. That's a curse coming from a prophet of Israel, and it's a curse today too. Don't let us be those people. Open our eyes so that we truly see. Open our ears so we can truly hear. And then let us rest in your love so that we are able to stand tall and do what we need to do. God bless the work of these two reverends who have given of their time to be able to be with us in this conversation. God bless all of you who have listened to us tonight. Let us resolve to birth a new America, an America that retains the very best of its heritage, but extends it to all of its children, equally and without discrimination. Mm -hmm. So that we, all of us can sit at the table and decide the future together. And let us all say, Amen. 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 Thank you very Amen. much. On behalf of American Jewish University, I'm going to turn this back to Deborah and Will Collin to finish us up. But God bless you both. And thank God you. God bless both you. For being thank with you. Us. Bye bye. Thank I, you. I have no words. I am so humbled in this moment to be amongst such incredible thought leaders and faith leaders and human beings. So from from my heart, thank you so much, Rabbi Artson, Rabbi Rabbi Reverend Dr. Whitlock, Reverend Dr. Smith Pollard. This has been a transformational hour for me, and I'm sure for everybody who has been on this webinar. I want to again thank the two, the three of you, for this amazing, amazing um, discussion. And I would like to thank. American Jewish University for giving us this, 
this platform for us to have this conversation and to allow for this, this, I, I'm again humbled and, and just this has been transformational. So thank you all and uh, God bless us all. God thank you. you. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you. Take care. Blessings. Blessings.